Hearing from Wayne by Bill Franzen, 1983. While I was flipping through the day's mail after a real yawn fest of a work day at the stereo shack, I came across something that knocked me over like a good brushback pitch. It was a postcard from Wayne, and I've really got to hand it to him. But before I get going on Wayne's postcard and on Wayne and on how Wayne was my best friend and just the whole incredible Wayne story, I'd like to say right up front that my real fear of any kind of hereafter is that instead of being sort of reunited with my family and friends and everyone I've ever felt close to, I'll get there and find myself in the middle of just casual acquaintances. People I recognize, people I always said, hi, how you doing to, but nobody I ever felt close to. Like the guy from the luncheonette, Kitty Corner from the Stereo Shack, who makes the great two-story ham sandwiches, plenty of mustard, but who I can't exactly say I'm attached to. He's a nice guy and all, and I even gave him 10% on some speakers once, but if he's the first person I see in the afterlife, it'll be some letdown. And if I reach life's 19th hole before him, and I'm the first one he sees, I can understand how it'll sour the whole experience for him, too. I'd probably try to duck before he saw me, but if he saw me ducking, that would be pretty awful. I mean, imagine yourself popping through into extra innings only to see one of your regular sandwich customers who suddenly ducks, pretends he doesn't know you, pretends you never made maybe 297 ham sandwiches for him during his lifetime, plenty of mustard. Now, I can't tell from Wayne's postcard if the afterlife ever starts out that creepy for anyone, but if it does, it's just like Wayne not to go into it. That's the way Wayne was, and one reason why he was my best friend and one reason why he'll stay my best friend, especially if he can keep up this great second effort through the mail. He did slip in a few comments about the afterlife on his card, but nothing that would scare any of us still playing Life's Back Nine. On a snowy night one year ago, Wayne and I were sitting and watering our faces in that Wild West bar called the Sitting Bull. Above the bar, there's this giant painting of four Sioux Indians in big flowing headdresses riding in a gondola in Venice that Wayne was so crazy about. And right in front of us, those upside-down cowboy hats with the barbecue-flavored party mix that we both liked. Wayne and I were swapping stories about Harold, the Stereo Shack's only TV salesman and a buddy from the Stereo Shack softball team. Harold had recently left the team and every other earthly organization after plowing smack into an oak tree. He wasn't even supposed to be driving. This guy was a narcoleptic, which means permission denied as far as getting your hands on a wheel in this state goes. So anyway, old Wayne and I get to wondering what Harold's 450 batting average is doing for him, wherever he is now, and soon we're speculating as to what that wherever actually is and if it would be possible for a guy exiting to that place to smuggle in a room equalizer. I explained to Wayne my fear of seeing just people I kind of recognize there, but take it as it comes, Wayne, of course, says he's not worried and laughs through a mouthful of party mix. He says he's expecting something more like the best room they have at the Ramada Inn in Fort Lauderdale, with telepathic models bringing you and your best deceased pals frothy turquoise drinks just as soon as you've all drained your clear orange ones. Eventually, I get around to telling Wayne about Houdini and his wife. I took this book out from the bookmobile once that was all about the Houdinis conducting their own afterlife experiment. They went and promised each other that the first one of them to die would do everything possible to reach the one still alive. Well, Harry Houdini died in 1926, and according to the book, before Beatrice Houdini died in 1943, she admitted that she'd never heard from Harry and called their experiment a failure. But Wayne, who I guess was feeling his boilermakers pretty well by then, says he loves the idea anyway, and he gets me to say what the heck and shake hands and then sign and date a Sitting Bull Bar cocktail napkin with him to cement our own pact. And a man next to us who's been muttering something about his sister making a thousand dollars a second seems glad to sign it too. Well, that was a year ago. Then, a half year later, Wayne and I are locking up the stereo shack after a real gutter ball of a business day when Wayne turns to me and says, let's call him. So we take turns calling our wives from a phone booth in the parking lot, and 20 cents later, we're loose. There's some all-you-can-stand fish fry at the Sitting Bull, but it sounds a little too bush league to us. Instead, we drive out to Long Lake and smack two large buckets of balls each at Denny's driving range. Wayne uses a three-wood, and after every swipe says, loud enough for everybody there, including Denny, to hear, that's on the green. Then we go nearby for some Italian and a couple of pitchers of draft beer. Later, when we're cruising back in my Toronado with all the windows down, Wayne finds the head of a green toy soldier in my glove compartment. It's just this tiny little rubbery soldier head without a body that my kid Timmy probably left around, and it made us sort of laugh. Then, Wayne puts it in his left nostril, just a little ways, so that the little army man could sort of look out, and then turn so they're both looking at me, and that really cracks me up. 
Next, Wayne says something like, eyes on the road, and snaps his head straight ahead so that the soldier watches the road. And it's stupid, but we're giggling like high schoolers and tears are coming down. But then Wayne, gasping for air, sort of snorts inwards, and the little head vanished, and we had to drive right to Long Lake Hospital, and it wasn't funny anymore. And the way it turned out, the inside of that hospital was the last thing on earth poor Wayne ever saw, at least in this life. Anyway, Wayne's postcard is a miniature version of the big painting above the bar at the Sitting Bull, the one with the four Sioux Indians in headdresses riding in a gondola in Venice. Except that on Wayne's postcard, there's a fifth passenger squeezed in between two of the Indians, and it's Wayne in his Stereo Shack softball uniform, smiling and with his cap on backwards. There wasn't a stamp or a postage mark anywhere on the card, but there was a decent-sized message in Wayne's usual slanty brand of printing. Wayne began by saying hi and saying he bet I was surprised he'd got a hold of me like we talked about and that he missed hanging out together, but that at least this was some kind of way to reach me. Then he asked if my Timmy was still playing Battle of the Bulge in the car and wrote ha-ha afterwards. He said that his notion of the hereafter being something like a room at the Ramada Inn in Fort Lauderdale was way off, except for the turquoise drinks. He said that the stereo systems there aren't nearly as impressive as you might expect, but added the acoustics in our modules are choice. He plays a lot of what he calls cluster ball there, a potent blend of golf, bowling, and softball for large numbers, in his words. Then he advised me to get out in life and shake my tail feathers all I can, and said if I wanted to perform one especially decent act, I should tell the police that 79 cats and 11 dogs are being kept inside a home at 281 South Brook Lane, about half a mile from Denny's driving range. Finally, Wayne said it's really not so bad after your third strike and not to worry about it, but just to stay loose and go with it and that everything will make a lot more sense to me when we meet up again. More than you could ever imagine right now, Wayne wrote. Which was nice of Wayne to say, and another reason why he was my best friend and why he'll stay my best friend, regardless of whether or not he can keep up this great second effort through the mail.